Okay, colleagues, so today we have a daunting task. We need to talk about Karl Marx. Now, uh, we speak often, I speak often in these lectures about the most important philosopher, right? And there are multiple valid interpretations of who is the most important philosopher in this course. Um, and but I want to say that Marx holds a very special place. Um, Marx occupies like a, a central position in this course in the sense that um, in the dialogue between all the other philosophers, Marx fills a particular niche. He raises a certain set of questions which I think hold a unique significance for us in the 21st century, for us understanding ourselves today. So um, I don't want to discount other philosophers by any means. So I'm, I think this is value in dialogue between political philosophers. And Marx should, I don't think that Marx should be read on his own. I think the most productive way to engage with Marx's thought is in the context of a course like this, in the context of philosophers like Plato, like Hobbes, like Rousseau, like Hegel, right? Uh, um, but at the same time, so Marx on his own, I feel somewhat incomplete without uh, uh, talking to these other, other philosophers, but the reverse is true looking at the other philosophers without talking about Marx also um, fills out certain important elements. So let's start somewhere. Um, I keep talking, and this, this may be the single most important uh, idea in the entire course, the idea that we talk about basically every lecture, but this notion of conflict and consensus, conflict and consensus, which are a little bit like a model or an ideal type, right? So we want to say that our society, to some extent, is conflictual, to some extent is consensual, right? So this, again, this uh, uh, notion due to Max Weber of an, again, ideal, ideal type or an idealized model where the reality is a combination of ideal types. And again, I, I don't know, uh, my listeners find themselves um, in different times, in different places, in different countries, right? And some countries are more consensual, some countries are more conflictual. Um, preliminarily, I, I feel that it, it's a good bet to imagine that most countries are somewhere in the middle, because, uh, uh, again, human beings, unlike fishes, right, need at least the cooperation of the immediate family in order to survive. So a vision of perfect conflict is incompatible with human life. So no society apparently it's just so bad uh, to be completely conflictual. But on the other hand, you know, most societies that, you know, we find ourselves in are, are less than perfectly consensual. So this is a, a good, again, an important thought that we keep coming back to. And to some extent, the value of political philosophy is to keep both of these ideas in context and uh, um, uh, to look at the um, visions, the, the criticisms that different philosophers offer on the conflictual side and the um, idealized visions, the normative ideals that philosophers proposed on the con propose on the consensual side, right? And use this sliding scale, use this continuum between perfect conflict and perfect consensus, use the various rulers, the various scales that philosophers offer to inform our understanding uh, um, of the real world. So when we talk about Marx in a very straightforward fashion, Marx is both a philosopher of conflict and of consensus. Um, actually, most of Marx's writing is devoted to the critique of capitalism. So, <laughs> you know, an oversimplified first pass at Marx is, is as of a philosopher of conflict. And this, is, this has mostly been the occasion for me mentioning Marx in this course uh, uh, in the previous lectures, right? So whenever we have been talking about conflict, about ruling class, dominating, oppressing uh, uh, the ruled, mm, to, when we talked about, okay, had an occasion to talk about ideology, systematic misrepresentation of reality, uh, conscious or unconscious, intentional or unintentional, I've always had the occasion to mention Marx, right? And, and this, um, I feel, this is, this is Marx's enduring legacy. Most people, uh, I feel, read Marx today for his critique of capitalism. And in fact, if you look at Marx's writings, you know, of the thousands of pages that Marx has written, mostly he writes about the critique of capitalism. But on the other hand, on the flip side, Marx also has a vision of this potential future con uh, uh, consensual society, of 
communism. And um, I have to, we have to be very careful, right? Marx actually writes very little about communism. S few scattered quotes. So I, I, would, I would even say a, a handful of scattered quotes uh, um, that, that, that deal with this uh, um, um, question of um, consensus. So, um, and you know, you could, could, could you say this is a tension in Marx? Well, it's a certain challenge in understanding Marx. Marx is mostly a, criti a, a critic of capitalism, but he's also, uh, I'm hes hesitant to use this word, but you know, often he's perceived as the prophet of communism. And this has, the consensual side, I feel has to be taken with a grain of salt, partly because Marx was much less focused on this issue and much more focused on the issue of critique of capitalism. Now, obviously, when we talk about this, so, uh, uh, so this is a wildly contested issue. It's a deeply problematic, deeply divisive issue, explosive issue. So there's a certain special challenge uh, uh, for students when they approach Marx. The best strategy, which is unfortunately impossible to follow, but ideally the best strategy for the students is just to bracket everything they know about Marx. Just forget. Imagine that they meet Marx for the first time in a course like this. Uh, and reasons are uh, for this uh, uh, problematic, this uh, uh, um, um, difficulty in appreciation of Marx is manifold. Uh, partly Marx himself is very complicated because he's writing about complicated stuff. Understanding uh, political and economic life is genuinely a complicated, a, a, a difficult task. We have spoken uh, uh, in the beginning of the course about this, uh, uh, um, you know, degrees of complexity. How in the physical sciences, there's this understanding that if you, if you take this as time in terms of the evolution of the universe, and on this side, uh, we can talk about uh, uh, entropy or complexity. Uh, um, so as entropy increases with time, um, complexity follows an inverse parabolic trajectory. And this is a hypothesis, but still, right? And so <laughs> the idea is that uh, um, <laughs> in some sense, right? Uh, physics, fundamental physics is simpler than chemistry. Chemistry is simpler than biology and biology is simpler than psychology or simpler than sociology. And sociology is not necessarily at the pinnacle, but sociology is close to the top. So understanding society, uh, uh, physicists believe, and I, I feel it's a, it's a pretty good guess, right? is in general just the most complicated thing that human beings can do. So it should not be, it should not come as a surprise that uh, 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 on this graph of uh, 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 um, complexity, you know, since social sciences occupy this uh, position close to the top on the graph of complexity, it should be no surprise that it's difficult to understand philosophers who are writing about this, right? Uh, uh, Marx as one of the founder, you know, as a philosopher, but also one of the founders of academic sociology, but also one of the founders or co-founders of uh, um, economic science, political economy, if you want, right? So Marx is difficult in his own right because his subject is difficult and his thoughts are complex for a good reason. But also we have to remember that Marx was used um, extensively, you know, he, he, he was caught in a crossfire of the Cold War and both sides deeply uh, misrepresented Marx's ideas, right? So like in, in the Soviet or in the communist bloc, Marx was <laughs> thought of as this, um, I don't know, patron, patron saint who got everything right. And it's just an unrealistic expectation of any human being. But uh, sort of on, on the other side of the, um, of the divide, Marx was vilified as having nothing to contribute, right? So it's a horrible villain, right? And both sides distorted and misrepresented Marx's thought, right? So in many ways, uh, uh, again, preliminarily, I wanna say that Marx, I think has some very interesting, very deep ideas, but these ideas, are often underdeveloped, they're unfinished. Marx, contrary to popular perception, actually doesn't have a manifesto. So Thomas Hobbes, for instance, has the Leviathan, right, as his book. Marx has never, has never finished writing a book like that. The project, I suppose, the, the closest that Marx has come is the project of Das Kapital, but of the, you know, 20 something projected volumes, only the first volume was published and, you know, Marx immediately, uh, you know, was dissatisfied and was tempted to revise what he has written. So Marx's thought is, is it was, you know, dynamic thought. It's a work in progress. So um, I'm going to try to summarize 
some, you know, what, what I take to be the important ideas of Marx, but we should um, always be like mm, careful with them. Again, Marx is not writing the Bible. Right? Marx is working with certain hypotheses which need to be uh, developed. There's a lot of blanks in Marx's works that need to be filled in. Um, and in the, in the coming segments, I want to uh, 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 discuss in detail what, what I think is uniquely productive about Marx's thought. So, before we begin uh, talking about the details of Marxist philosophy, let's try to somehow summarize the conclusions or the contributions. Um, now, I feel that the, uh, Marx, first and foremost, was a political philosopher, and he's best understood as a political philosopher. And again, within the context of this course, um, I feel that Marx is in a deep dialogue with the philosophers we've been talking about before. Um, so, broadly speaking, the immediate context for Marx's thought is the politics of the Enlightenment. Politics of the Enlightenment. So we are talking about this ideal of true human emancipation, which is this real functioning democracy. And I remind you, right, um, that um, we've been talking with uh, uh, you know, John Stuart Mill, his notion of free and equal discussion, or Jean-Jacques Rousseau with his idea of the general will, or um, um, Hegel with his idea of the constitutional state of laws. I want to say in Rousseau, in Hegel, and in Mill, in Rousseau, in Hegel, and in Mill, we have this idea of uh, the possibility of the solution to the problem of politics. The possibility that uh, uh, basically human beings take that, we, we take our desires, you know, we have a wish list of desires, and we apply uh, um, a rational dialogical procedure. So, reason plus dialogue. So, we take a wish list of desires and we engage in a rational dialogue between each other. Again, human beings, it's a strong assumption that most philosophers in this course will follow, that human desires cannot really be satisfied in isolation, that in order to be properly human and properly happy, human beings need to be members of well-functioning, well-ordered societies. So, we have desires by assumption, and these desires are best satisfied together with others. So we get together and we try to rationally decide on what is the best way uh, to maximize our collective happiness, if you want, right? And, you know, there's a certain utilitarian element to this picture, and I feel that this utilitarian element exists in Rousseau, in Hegel, and also in Marx, which is why I feel it's very important for us to, you know, read John Stuart Mill carefully, right? And uh, uh, the upshot of this picture is that once we get together, engage in this rational dialogue, we can find a certain arrangement, again, the solution to the problem of history, the solution to the problem of politics, which is to, again, rational individuals get together, rationally decide on what is the best arrangement, such that free rational individuals freely follow the rational laws that they have, you know, made together, uh, um, such that we get free obedience. We obey, and yet we obey freely. Again, this wonderful uh, phrase due to Jürgen Habermas, but which is equally applicable to Socrates, the, the two poles, the beginning and the end of our course, right? The peculiarly unforced force of the better argument, the only force that a free citizen recognizes, is the peculiarly unforced force of the better argument. The Zwang clause and Zwang, the specific arguments. So we, we free, remain free, and yet we obey. And in obeying the law, in the, in the words of Rousseau, each nevertheless obeys only himself and remains as free as before. So free obedience. Um, and this, this is the idea, I, you know, it's my assertion, strong assertion, I, I believe this is the correct reading of Marx. This is Marx's ideal. We talked about this, again, in, in so many previous classes. Again, some combination of freedom, fulfillment, happiness, maybe freedom as instrumental for human flourishing, but this is what society is aimed at. Um, and immediately, so all of this 
question about you know what is the goal of communism you know sort of um, some kind of perceived false dichotomy between communism and, and democracy I want to say this is a deeply mistaken misperception of Marx for Marx communism is the realization of the promise of true functioning democracy Marx does not use the word democracy for technical reasons we'll probably get into uh, um, but this is this is Marx's ideal and importantly Marx, by and large, does not write in detail about this ideal. So I want to say, if we want to understand what communism is, we need to read. We need to read Rousseau, we need to read Hegel, we need to read Mill. Maybe we also read, need to read uh, Nietzsche and Foucault and Habermas and other philosophers. But I want to say that, again, um, Marx does not have a theory, fully-fledged theory of, you know, how does communist legitimacy work? How, does, how is communist state organized? So it's important for us, again, uh, Marx is in dialogue with other philosophers, and it's important to hear the other, side, the other sides of the issue. I feel that you know, reading Marx without Rousseau um, is, a, is a, a deeply problematic enterprise. We need to read people like Rousseau and Hegel in order to understand what is Marx's ideal. And by and large, by and large, my strong assertion is that Marx agrees with, with their ideal. So to call Marx a totalitarian is just a misunderstanding, misrepresentation of Marxist philosophy. And again, somehow this notion that, uh, uh, you know, so you understand these are uh, deeply um, controversial, um, explosive topics, right? So even asking this question, you know, what does the um, experience of the Soviet Union or of Soviet China teach us? I have students coming from all over the world. And some students assume that the Soviet Union or Soviet China were wonderful countries. And uh, in fact, by you know, so many objective measures, much better than uh, uh, um, you know, Western democracies like America or Britain. And it's completely obvious to them. You know, and, and to the other side of the room, you know, sort of like half of the room just unravels a red flag when we talk about Marx. And the other side of the room uh, um, you know, thinks, no, that you know, Marx is the, uh, the most horrible villain and there's blood on his hands. Right? And I want us to step back from both of these uh, visions and let's try not to get bogged down. Again, Marx is writing way before he's, he, Marx died before the revolution in Russia happened. And the relationship of Marx to revolutions in Russia and China is a compl complicated separate topic. Let's not, you know, now let's try to bracket this topic out. It's, it's very clear that Marx's ideal, if you believe uh, uh, that real existing Marxist socialism led to some form of abuse, I think it's very important for us to, at the outset, to understand that this is antithetical to Marx's own values. Mm -hmm. So you could say communism is about freedom and flourishing, flourishing through freedom, the free development of each as a condition from, for the free development of all. Right? This is, uh, for, for Marx, uh, a communist society is first and foremost a free society which allows the free development and therefore the flourishing of human individuality. Yeah, we're going to talk about this down the line. But again, Marx mostly does not spend time talking about this kind of, I want to say, uh, uh, kind, of, kind of outsourcing of, of these ideas of political philosophy to, to other philosophers. Marx assumes that uh, free rational individuals will get together and decide what is the best way to organize society. So this uh, uh, side of the board, the politics of enlightenment, the politics of the project of enlightenment, the ideal of true human emancipation, the ideal of real functioning democracy is there in Marx every step of the way. But mostly it exists in the background and Marx does not thematize it. So I feel it's important for us at the outset to, to understand this is where Marx wants to get. This is his end point. But most of his time, most of the pages that Marx wrote, he spends on this other issue, right? So there's the politics of enlightenment and we need to read Rousseau, Hegel and Mill to understand this. Uh, 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 but Marx's own unique contribution is that the project of enlightenment, the real democracy, the real emancipation is impossible unless particular economic conditions are fulfilled. That human beings cannot be politically free if they are economically unfree. Mm -hmm. And so, so uh, this is the conflictual side of the story. This is gonna be Marx's critique of feudalism, if you want, Marx's critique of capitalism, very importantly, right? Uh, um, within capitalism, the most important phrase is this coercive laws of market competition that actually, uh, um, under, under capitalism, under the, what 
people at the day called democracies, not real democracy, but capitalist parliamentarism, in which in fact, human beings are formally free. We have a formally free constitution, but in reality, human beings, humanity, the general will, if you want Rousseau in general will does not rule. What actually rules are the co impersonal coercive laws of market competition. Yes, you have the ruling class, but at the end of the day, the, um, the ruling class is just as unfree as the ruled, kind of the, the, the most important form of unfreedom is actually structural unfreedom, which makes Marx's thought uh, um, difficult to understand. Uh, you know, by, by and large, it's, it's like Marx is not a, it's not, a it's not a conspiracy theorist. It's not like there's an evil ruling class who pull the strings behind the, 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 the curtain, right? Marx is a sociologist. He sees certain important structural determinations. And what is important for Marx is, again, that there are values which are produced by the coercive laws of market competition, if you want to oversimplify. Efficiency for the sake of efficiency, which uh, undermines human freedom and human flourishing uh, of everyone in society, including of the nominally ruling class, uh, um, the, the, the bourgeoisie. But sort of the most important unfreedom is structural unfreedom in Marx. And, and this is why sort of, again, like for, for um, I want to say, if we want to understand Marx's positive project, the project of communism, we need to read Rousseau, Hegel, and Mill. But also, if we just read Rousseau, Hegel, and Mill, that's not enough. Because the project of Rousseau, Hegel, and Mill, Marx is going to say, is impossible unless economic conditions are met. If you want, uh, political democracy is impossible without economic democracy. We talked about this last time. We have spoken about this last time. Again, this, uh, um, 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 the ideals of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, the general will, at odds with the reality of the Industrial Revolution. So French Revolution versus the Industrial Revolution, right? And, uh, um, the, the, you know, there's a potentiality. It's possible to resolve this conflict because the Industrial Revolution actually provides this enormous uh, potential from hu for human emancipation from economic necessity. Productivity of labor increases, and this increase could be used to free individual human beings from the burden, from the toil of work. And then uh -huh, the free time that we gain through economic progress can be used in order to establish, maintain, sustain, and enlarge the political freedom. Mm -hmm. So economic freedom as basis for political freedom. But instead, what happens, according to Marx, is through coercive laws of competition in the market, the excess productivity in society is not used for uh, human well-being, but it's used basically, you know, profit for profit's sake, uh, uh, you know, um, this efficiency for efficiency's sake, which at the end of the day, nobody enjoys, even the bourgeoisie does not enjoy. And therefore, again, within this, I think it's very important to understand from, from the outset, the consensual project of Marx, the project of communism, is not the revenge of the poor against the rich. I, I feel it's a deep misperception of what Marx is trying to do. Now, again, uh, uh, um, the same way that we have spoken in, in, in Rousseau and in Hegel, how the general will entails no sacrifice on the part of the individual. This is not the sacrifice of the individual for the sake of the collective. No, no, no. Society, in this uh, fashion of the positive freedom, a well-constituted society, properly speaking, enables our human flourishing, our human freedom, right? So, and the idea, the idea is that, again, this more rational, a freer form of arrangement, which Marx calls communism, is going to be in the interest of everybody, not just the workers, but also the bourgeoisie. Now, I suppose last point, which I want to uh, note parenthetically, is that very often Marx is caricatured as this quasi-religious thinker who imagines this, you know, pie in the sky, earthly paradise, which is called communism. And I feel, again, it's a very deep misperception. Uh, um, <laughs> this is a struggle. This is a struggle. The consensual uh, project is not given. It's not a given. We have to fight for it. And it's a real struggle which can be won or can be lost. Basically, in, in the first paragraph of the Communist Manifesto, Marx writes that the class struggle usually or often or always ends either with the victory of the progressive class or with the common ruin of the contending classes. So the moving forward towards communism or the alternative is clear. The common ruin of the contending classes. And many Marxists after Marx have spoken about this dilemma. Uh, socialism or barbarism? Socialism or barbarism? This is the choice, but the choice is not given. 
Right. And well, <laughs> this is a preview <laughs> of the conclusions. And hopefully, in the coming segments, we'll be able to unpack uh, uh, some of the details of this picture. So if I were to try to summarize what I take to be the most important takeaway point from Marxist philosophy, is that capitalism is the continuation of feudalism by other means, to paraphrase Clausewitz, right? So capitalism is a continuation of feudalism by other means. Capitalism is feudalism on steroids. Um, so let me, try, let me try to unpack this. So it's like feudalism is an arrangement which is obviously unfree, coercive, unjust. Well, I say obviously. There's a broad consensus in the world today that feudalism is unjust, right? Or um, it's unjust, conflictual, it's based on domination, violence, it's based on ideology, right? And to see certain elements, similar elements uh, 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 of domination, violence, and ideology in capitalism, this is sort of the true um, import of Marxist philosophy, the strength of his philosophy. Um, so, let's, I mean, we're talking about conflict consensus, and in the schema, we go from conflict to consensus. And uh, we mentioned last time, again, I think this wonderfully productive uh, tripartite um, structure from um, Hegel, undifferentiated unity, differentiated disunity, differentiated unity. I'm going to return to this once again. So. Um, Often people talk about the theory of history in Marx. I feel it should be taken with a grain of salt. Marx himself was uh, uh, ambiguous as to whether you actually have uh, um, laws of uh, history and, and not just some kind of historical reconstruction of you know, the stages through which, let's say, Europe went. Um, and very often people begin with so-called primitive communism or talk about slavery. I want to focus on feudalism, capitalism, and, and communism. Basically, these are, these are the three terms I want to focus on. And when we start with feudalism, uh, so again, the, idea, the, the, the conclusion that we're trying to get to is that capitalism is a continuation of feudalism by other means. That there are important elements which capitalism and feudalism have in common, right? So, and when we talk about feudalism, uh, I suppose kind of the basic idea is that feudal society is, a, is an unfree society. That it's a society which is based on violence, coercion, domination. Let's, let me write the word violence. And basically, we're talking about two kinds of violence. There's a, a, a ideological or symbolic violence, um, and there's a threat of physical violence, you know, coercion by the army, if you want. So when we talk about ideological violence, you can imagine, again, and remember, it's a wonderful question that we keep asking in this course. What is good? What is the good? What should human beings do? Right? And imagine we live in the Middle Ages and we ask, what is good? Oh, uh, we, we have, you have institutions like the church, the Catholic church, or the universities, which exist within the purview of the Catholic church. Think tanks right, of the Middle Ages. And they will tell you what is good. They will tell you that there's, there's a good God who orders this world in the best possible way, that uh, uh, there's a revelation from God, the Bible, and there are the priests who authoritatively can interpret the revelation. And it's very clear that in the Middle Ages, most people would agree today, right? Uh, that in the Middle Ages, um, uh, the, well, the relationship between the church and the state, of course, is complicated, right? But there's a set of ideas, and religion plays a very important part in the set of ideas. It's not the only part. Uh, uh, um, that justifies the domination of serfs by the lords, uh, maybe domination by the king, right? So uh, especially this notion of the divine right of kings, divine right. right? So you see, <laughs> keep talking since the very first class about this conflict between philosophy and religion. You see this conflict right here on the board, right? What is, what is the good? God will tell you what is good. You're a serf. Obey your master. S slaves obey, uh, uh, should obey their masters. So, very famous statements from various portions of the, uh, of the Hebrew Bible and of the New Testament, right? Um, is this a satisfying answer? No, it's not a satisfying answer. But, oh, 
obviously, you know, so, um, I, I keep talking about how feudalism is this undifferentiated unity. In fact, uh, Marx has this phrase about the idiocy of rural life, the unity of the peasant with their immediate environment, a certain, uh, I don't want to be too judgmental about this, but there's a certain kind of animal-like quality in the life of a, of a um, feudal serf. Uh, a unity of the peasant with their environment. Uh, in a similar way, Marx would imagine how there's a unity between the let's say, a beaver and the dam that the beaver is bu building, right? And feudalism is a deeply static, uh, um, it's a, not a dynamic uh, way of organizing society, uh, right? And, but this idyllic feudal relationship, of course, breaks down every so often, right? Because no matter how strong religion is, no matter how strong is this talk of the divine right of kings, from time to time, the, the peasants understand that they are being taken advantage of. And you have peasant uprisings, which happen with regularity, you know, all throughout the world. And this is where the threat of physical violence comes in. There's the king and king's army, right? And so the notion is that basically feudalism, the feudal domination, is based on, on these two kinds of violence. It's a deeply unfree society. And um, in... Hegel and in Marx, there's this understanding that, or a certain idea, notion, that feudalism cannot be honest with itself. That it's like, remember talking about the end of history? Feudalism cannot be the end of history because necessarily feudalism involves coercion and, and deception. And in the long run, uh, uh, Marx and Hegel imagine this is not a stable situation. So this, is a, this is a conflictual situation, this conflict inherent in the feudal mode of arrangement. So it could be that temporarily the uh, ruling class, the lords, can suppress the serfs, but the potential for conflict is always there. That is what, because this is unresolved, unresolved conflict, right? Uh, deception and violence. That potentially this is never, uh, the, this can never count as the solution to the problem of history. Now, of course, the worst nightmare of political philosophy is some form of super-efficient dictatorship which uh, uh, stays in power and just dominates the subject, you know, super Hobbesian Leviathan that does, does not take care of its subjects, right? So the worst nightmare, does Hegel and Marx have an argument against that? I'm not sure. I feel it's more of an optimistic hope on the part of Hegel and Marx that this is not a, an ultimate arrangement, but you can see a certain logic behind what they're saying. So again, that there's an unresolved conflict which is inherent in the system. So uh, uh, then the idea is that we move forward and uh, um, capitalism, it's a long story, I am terribly oversimplifying, but capitalism in a certain sense is based on the ideas of popular sovereignty, on the ideas of social contract. I mean, capitalism, his, capitalism itself uh, extensively uses the notions of contract, uh, but uh, 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 capitalism tends to see society as a contract in general, right? So we have a free and equal discussion. We make a, a wish list, right? The project of enlightenment. We make a wish list of all the things that we desire. So again, the utilitarian element. Again, this is not Locke. This is not Kant. We don't derive values from pure reason. No, we have a list of desires and we get together and we negotiate what is the best way to satisfy our desires together at the same time, right? So we have this wish list of desires and we have a free and equal discussion. And notice, if we, don't, if we do not have a free and equal discussion, if we exclude some people, then we have to employ force and violence. Hmm? People have to either be part of your free and equal discussion, or if you say, look, our vote is going to count more than your vote, then this situation uh, uh, um, necessarily, you know, turns conflictual and, uh, you know, you have to resort to these kinds of ideas. Um, so again, so free and equal discussion. But Marx is going to say that actually, in reality, in reality of the situation, what happens is that... Um, you get formal freedom and equality, what he calls mere political emancipation, but you do not get true human emancipation. So uh, uh, let me write formal freedom, formal equality, and mere, so only mere political emancipation. as opposed to true human emancipation. Um, and this could potentially take a, a, a long time to unpack, but the idea is that 
you know, in theory, cap, you know, uh, the capitalist arrangement, again, sort of French Revolution plus the Industrial Revolution, in theory, we have formal freedom and equality, but in reality, we have a continuation of uh, something analogous to feudal domination. Again, so in feudalism, it's important. It's a bit of an oversimplification, but as an oversimplification, you could say that there are two classes, right? The, the uh, dominant and the dominated, the lords and the serfs. And in capitalism, you still have two classes, the, the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. So here you had rule by birth, maybe, and but here, under in capitalism, formally, we're all free. Formally, each vote counts the same, but in reality, the rich, the wealthy, have much more political capacity to deploy uh, uh, their vote, to you know, mobilize uh, political, the political system to achieve their goals. And so, you, Marx is going to say that you still have violence, right? And again, so we talked about ideological and physical violence. And so the ideological violence uh, is basically going to be the free market ideology. Uh, free market ideology. And what is the free market ideology? Well, we know, we have spoken about this before. So this would be people like John Locke and uh, Adam Smith. Notice, what John Locke and Adam Smith are saying is that the moral justification of capitalism is that it is in everybody's interest. Remember, Locke talks about a day laborer and Adam Smith talks about a frugal peasant. The idea that a day laborer under capitalism for Locke or a frugal peasant under capitalism for Adam Smith is so much better off than our ancestors used to be when we were sort of living in the state of nature or something like that, right? Um, so again, the justification, the free market ideology says there is no alternative. Capitalism is the most efficient, the best system, best for everyone. And again, Locke and Smith are going to say, especially Adam Smith, we'll talk about universal opulence, trickle down, trickle down. How, um, you know, if you try to regulate or change this system, then everybody will be worse off. Kind of this is, this is the ideological um, justification. And then every so often, you know, we talked about peasant uprising, every so often when the workers decide to strike, uh, there's also a threat of physical violence. Um, and the physical violence, again, if you look, if you open history books, um, I, kinda, I feel I want to write the, uh, 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 the year 1848, uh, the revolutions of 1848. It's uh, actually the year when the Communist Manifesto was uh, published, right? So you literally have state violence. When the machine gun uh, is firing on the, on the crowds of sometimes peaceful protesters, right? So 1848 is just one example. You, again, open history books and think about when, when state violence is deployed in the interest of uh, capitalism or capitalist system uh, um, against, against the interest of the workers, right? And so the idea is that the, you had the lords and the serfs, and here you have the bourgeoisie and the proletariat, the, the, the capitalists and the workers. And the relations are analogous, kind of seeing um, capitalism as a continuation of freedom, but by other means. Now, of course, remember, now we have formal freedom and equality. We, did, we, used, to, we used to not have this in feudalism. So in feudalism, there was this belief kind of in the divine, in the sacred tie that binds the, the, the serf to his or her superior, right? And, but here the idea is that no, we're all formally free and equal. We have the equality you know, at the starting line, the equality of opportunity, but, but actually at the end of the day, uh, um, you know, big business, big business interest has much more capacity to deploy their uh, political interests if you want. So ultimately what I'm trying to say is that for Marx, what happens is that under capitalism, um, unfreedom in the market, unfreedom and inequality in the market subverts the political process. That while the vast majority of the population are poor and, and have to work um, for you know, most of their conscious life, it's kind of, you have this unfreedom in the shop floor. And you know, think of this, economic relations are also political relations. If 
Your boss has the power to order you around. What is the essential difference between that and the feudal lord ordering their serf around? Right? So Marx, Marx wants to see this. And, uh, uh, but it's very important, and it's a whole separate story that we need to devote uh, quite a bit of time to. Capitalism is actually, for Marx, a wonderful thing, and it is a necessary for communism. With all of its problems, capitalism is the necessary next stage, because without the form of freedom and equality, you cannot even pose the question of the real freedom and equality. So, uh, uh, capitalism is actually, for Marx, a, you know, the best thing that has ever happened to humanity in its entire history. I'm saying something very controversial, but I believe it's true. It's the correct reading of Marx. Communism is impossible without capitalism. Communism, sorry, um, yeah, capitalism lays the necessary foundation for a future communist society. Uh, um, and so basically, so if capitalism was formal freedom and equality, uh, um, what communism is going to give us is the real freedom and equality. So this was formal freedom. This is going to be real freedom. Uh, notice, I'm talking about freedom, freedom, and this is not mere political emancipation, but true human emancipation. So, in many ways, the realization of the promise that the French Revolution, that the capitalist system has already given to us. So, we're talking about these concepts. Feudalism, capitalism, communism, Marx would call them socio-economic formations. Let me suggest a particular way of looking uh, uh, at, the, at these concepts. Now, this is a particular, I, I have to warn you, this is a particular reading of Marx. It's somewhat controversial, but I actually think it's the best reading of Marx. Um, and this reception of Marx is mostly due to uh, a wonderful, and a very careful reader, a wonderful scholar, and a very careful reader of Marx, Max Weber. Uh, so German sociologist Max Weber. Max Weber has this, again, phrase which I keep referring to, ideal types. And an ideal type, again, is an abstraction, generalization, idealization, so an abstract model, uh, as Max Weber himself calls it, an einseitische Steigerung, a one-sided accentuation, right? So it's an idealization, an oversimplification of reality, right? And, uh, uh, um, the, the notion would be that reality can be described by a combination, you know, or, or I should say reality can be approximated by combining uh, um, several kinds of ideal types, or, or several different ideal types. For example, I talked about conflict consensus, right? Maybe reality is some kind of combination between the ideal type of conflict, ideal type of consensus. So, let me try uh, to make this uh, more precise. Again, this is a Weberian reading, Weberian interpretation of Marx, but broadly speaking, I think it's the most fruitful interpretation and the clearest and the most consistent interpretation. That, uh, so let's forget about hunter-gatherer hunter and slave societies. They exist, but you know, for the purposes of this uh, uh, lecture, let's just forget about them. Let's focus on, again, feudalism, capitalism, and communism. So feudalism is an ideal type of direct domination of men by men. So when one human being directly dominates another human being, we, we, call, we call this like the ideal type of feudalism or serfdom. Um, does this exist in the world today? Yes, probably. Right? In most places it does exist. So a reality is a combination of different ideal types. So feudalism, to some extent, feudal or quasi-feudal institutions, to some extent exist even today. Right? Whenever there's uh, corruption or nepotism, Right? This is probably best described, or I mean, as, as a hypothesis, is best described maybe by some kind of feudal arrangement. So feudalism is mostly based on, again, this patrimonialism and what uh, Max Weber calls traditional authority, the divine right of kings, if you want. But to some extent, even in contemporary world, in certain areas, you can still see the continuation of feudalism uh, um, as feudalism. Again, coercion, violence. When, when um, um, yeah, a, a robber, you know, if a robber corners uh, their victim in a dark alley, this is something like feudalism, maybe, right? Uh, the second ideal type is then capitalism. And I want to kind of underline this. 
Marx's work, most, his most important work, unfinished work, Das Kapital, unpublished and in many ways unpublishable, right, in its entirety, uh, um, has a subtitle, Critique of Political Economy. So Marx, to a lesser extent, is actually talking about capitalism as it exists. And to, to a larger extent, Marx is talking about a certain idealized vision of communism, oh, sorry, of capitalism. Like an idealized vision of capitalism in the works of, for example, classical political economists like Adam Smith. So Marx, to a large extent, criticizes not real existing capitalism, because that's complicated, but a if you want a spherical capitalism in a vacuum, spherical capitalism in a vacuum, an idealization of capitalism in a vacuum. And under this idealization, the only thing that rules or matters at the end of the day are the coercive laws of market competition. Coercive laws of market competition. And many examples can be given of this. Let, let's take one example, right? So uh, the wage is driven down. Now, let's flesh out this picture, right? You have producers, they compete. Let's imagine I'm a capitalist, but I'm a humane capitalist. And I want to increase the wages of my workers. I want to pay them more. Marx is going to say, I cannot do that. Because if I try to increase my wage because of the curse of laws of competition in the market, I lose the competitive advantage over uh, my competitors, competitor capitalists, and I go bankrupt and I become a member of the proletariat myself. Mm -hmm. So you see, for capitalism, the bourgeoisie are not evil, especially in this idealized picture. They are simply doing what they can to survive. They have no choice. Again, within the idealized political, you know, economic models, producers are price takers. Under perfect competition, profit tends to zero. And uh, that's why you need to minimize all your costs as much as possible. And so if you decide to pay your workers more, you just go out of business. And so there's a natural tendency, Marx believes, I don't, let's not think about this as an iron law, but as a natural tendency for the wage to go down towards subsistence wage. And to some extent, this is actually what happens in the 19th century, let's say, industrial Manchester that, uh, uh, you know, Marx and Engels write about, right? How the uh, working hours, working week increases as much as possible, you know, 12, 14, 15, 16 hours a day with no uh, weekend, right? And, and the wage goes down towards the bare subsistence minimum. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that this is not anybody's free choice. The, the capitalist has to exploit the workers. Otherwise, uh, they go out of business, they become bankrupt and become workers themselves. And the workers have no choice in the matter because, well, it's a long and complicated story. There's the, the technological progress produces the reserve army of the unemployed. Mm -hmm. The, the, the technological progress, the, the more is the productivity of labor, the fewer laborers you need. So capitalism through competition, again, competition drives capitalists to innovate. And this innovation systematically produces excess of workers. And because there's this reserve army of, of unemployed, workers have a basic choice between working for subsistence wage or starving to death. And so again, it's, it's, it's not freedom, but it's also not necessarily, it's, it's somewhat different from feudal kind of coercion, right? The workers are formally free. They are formally free to not work and starve to death, right? But it is, you know, the, the, the pain of hunger, the whip of hunger is, is still there. Um, but again, the point is that this is purely structural and it follows from a certain kind of economic analysis in the course of laws of competition market. But in reality, it's never that clear cut. In reality, the profits are never zero. In reality, no uh, industry is perfectly competitive. In reality, the, uh, the wage is never equal or almost never equal to the subsistence wage, right? Uh, now, I should also add, um, I feel it's kind of an important addition, but Marxists after Marx, uh, or actually Max Weber or Jürgen Habermas, who are not exactly Marxists, but who are readers of Marx, will also talk about a different kind of logic, a different kind of ideal type. Marx does not talk about this. This would be state capitalism. It's kind of the uh, 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 coercion by bureaucratic mechanisms, right? And maybe this is the best description of the Soviet Union, which was not really communist, which we'll get to in, in a moment. But, you know, state cap, or I mean, like today, if you talk about, you know, advanced capitalist countries of the world, like America, is America purely capitalist? 
Well, no, there's a huge governmental bureaucracy, there's a huge governmental sector, huge proportion of American GDP is actually uh, uh, directly controlled by, um, by the executive branch. So, 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 you know, you could say that most countries are at least a combination of these three ideal types. And this is, this is, you know, Marx does not pay nearly enough attention to the logic of the state. This is a weak point in Marxist theory, but I feel that it's, it's important to note that this ideal type also exists for the sake of completion. And now beyond, beyond uh, uh, these three forms of coercion, domination of men by men, this feudal domination of men by men, this coercive laws of market competition, coercive laws of bureaucratic domination, in addition to these three forms of coercion, there's the fourth ideal type, ideal type of freedom, ideal type of free and equal discussion, where people, you know, some like, you know, uh, uh, Marx talks about Soviets, right? well, I mean, Marxists talk about Soviets, Marx talks about councils, right? a direct democratic system of councils, where there's public deliberation, where there's transparency, there's accountability, some like Rousseau and general will, and you could ask, do people sometimes make decisions, not because they're forced to, not because they're forced to by market considerations, not because they're forced to by governmental bureaucracies, but do people at least sometimes make decisions because they're genuinely in their common interest and there is transparency and accountability. And I wanna say that to the extent that people sometimes make decisions freely, mm -hmm, at least in certain contexts, to this extent, we already live in communism at least to some extent. So Marx, again, uh, utopian and scientific socialism, Marx insists that uh, uh, kind of this dream of just people getting together and holding hands, maybe something that Locke might say or Kant might say, this is, this is all utopian dreaming. So scientific socialism, it talks about how there are mechanisms that, you know, force, <laughs> if you want, uh, individuals into, um, Again, this free and equal arrangement. Marx's idea basically is that capitalism, by and large, is just much more uh, efficient than feudalism. And so capitalism drives feudalism to extinction. And in a similar fashion, Marx imagines that this free and equal arrangement of society is going to be so much more efficient that communism is going to drive capitalism to extinction. Right? So we, communism is a more humane society, a more free society, but also a more efficient society. And Marxists after Marx are going to ask this question. Is it necessarily true? Is a more humane society necessarily more efficient society at the same time? So there's a problem, uh, uh, um, problem there, right? But still, again, so utopian and scientific socialism. S scientific socialism talks about mechanisms and scientific socialism has to talk about real tendencies that are present right now. So I think the right way to read Marx is to look at particular examples that we can see in the world today and say, yeah, this is already not, not full, fully fledged communism, but this is communism to some extent, to some extent, like a proof of concept, if you want. And, and then, you know, it's, it's a complicated picture. And then to see our reality as a combination of all four ideal types, right? And very important, I wanna stress this deep conclusion. Maybe this is the conclusion of the entire course, I don't know. Uh, uh, but you know, some philosophers like Jurgen Habermas or maybe Michel Foucault or Antonio Gramsci uh, uh, would imagine, especially in the words of Habermas, that the, the task of political philosophy is to try to enlarge the sphere of free and equal discussion, of real human freedom, to enlarge this sphere Mm -hmm. and to protect the sphere of free and equal discussion against the coercion by state bureaucracy, against the coercion by the logic of the market, and against the you know, coercion by you know, these nepotistic, uh, corrupt patrimonial forces in this <laughs> deep civilizing mission of political philosophy. So one of Marx's key concepts is the concept of alienation. Um, it's a complicated term that Marx mostly uses in his early writings and some reason to believe that uh, Marx's ideas undergo a certain change. It's a very famous uh, contrast between uh, a potentially early humanistic Marx and later structural Marx. Uh, uh, for example, contrast drawn by a famous um, 
Marxist commentator Louis Althusser. Um, so, but so we should take the notion of alienation with a grain of salt. And sometimes I uh, give lectures on Marx without mentioning the word alienation even once. But maybe maybe it's a, a good way to uh, exemplify some of his ideas. So we have met the word alienation already in the works of um, um, Hegel. So for Hegel, alienation is this notion that we do not feel at home in the world. The idea is that we can overcome alienation and uh, 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 achieve certain differentiated unity, right? So this like a notion of we begin with some kind of innocent quasi-animal stage of undifferentiated unity with of man with of human beings with their surroundings. Then we go through the stage of differentiated disunity or alienation. We feel alienated from the world. And uh, 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 it's negative, it's conflictual, but it is necessary uh, in terms of human development, right? Um, and then we arrive at a later stage of differentiated unity. We don't go back, but we overcome alienation. And it's important for Marx. Communism is not a more primitive society. It is a more advanced society. Marx wants to say that uh, under communism, we have more wants, and we try to satisfy them even more, right? So it's like uh, this proliferation of wants and prolif proliferation of uh, 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 technical capacity to uh, satisfy these wants is an important part of progress of human history. But still, so uh, uh, when we talk about alienation, uh, this is a ca characteristically uh, characteristic um, phrase that Marx applies to capitalism. He talks about how human beings are alienated from the products of their labor, that uh, the, the products of our labor do not belong to us. And here's where you can see these elements of undifferentiated unity in feudalism, because under feudalism, presumably, the worker feels unity with the work. You know, you're, you're a peasant, you're growing, I don't know, carrots or something, and the carrots are yours. And you know, some of them you will eat yourself, some of them you will give up as uh, 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 taxation in kind to the Lord, but still the carrots are yours, you control your uh, products of your labor, right? This is different under capitalism. Under capitalism, especially in sort of large-scale industrial capitalism, individuals very often do a simple task, like especially if you imagine a conveyor belt, for example. So the, there's no way in which uh, uh, an individual producer produces a car or produces even a marker. You do a certain operation which contributes to the production of the car, but you, you like at no point in the process do you own the product, right? So and notice, so so alienation is going to be a uh, 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 different under capitalism versus feudalism, uh, uh, but also versus presumably communism. And if you imagine, well, again, it's important to imagine some kind of real-world examples of communism, right? Uh, at least to some extent, right? So uh, um, somebody who does something for the intrinsic value of the work, right? So this is um, ancient Greek positive conception of uh, 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 human freedom, right? Um, imagine Isaac Newton writing Principia, right? So he's not forced by feudal obligations to write Principia, and he's not writing Principia for profit, right? Uh, um, Marx himself uses this example. He talks about how uh, John Milton writes Paradise Lost the, the way the worm produces silk right, from internal necessity, but so to speak, freely. And uh, uh, so the, the, the feudal peasant controls the product, but also the, a free producer presumably would control their product. But the workers do not. And the workers do not own the product. They do not exchange the product. The product belongs to the capitalist. The second uh, uh, notion is the uh, process of the labor. And again, in many ways, it's important, the idea of alienation, the, the, uh, the uh, proletariat is alienated, but also the bourgeoisie is alienated for Marx. We're all alienated, un alienated under capitalism. Uh, um, and <laughs> you can find this, you know, it's like your job can be more comfortable, it can be more well paid, but still you do not feel that you are producing something meaningful that fulfills you. And again, likewise, this con control over the process of the labor, that it is capitalism that decides when you wake up in the morning. It is capitalism that decides what food you eat, when do you go on holiday, right? Uh, uh, when your work begins and when it ends. Mm -hmm. uh, again, as opposed to the feudal peasant who maybe to a larger extent is in control of the process. Maybe, you know, if they don't feel well, they can decide to plow the field tomorrow. Or, you know, uh, 
as opposed to this kind of free producer, like Newton. If he doesn't feel like producing Pankipia, he can uh, uh, take a break. Likewise, so alienation of men from men um, under feudalism, mostly again, peasants work together, it's kind of communal life. Um, but, and, 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 and likewise, if you think of Newton, if you think of Newton's Pankipia, um, Newton, of course, he has rivals, like Leibniz, for example, was Newton's rival. But Newton, by and large, wants to share his ideas with the world. He wants to be acknowledged, it's an element of glory seeking, but by and large, he wants people to read Principia, to see his brilliant ideas and credit him for his brilliant ideas. You know, uh, uh, in some sense, under communism, everybody is your friend. Uh, but under capitalism, there's this competition. Um, so producers versus producers, producers versus consumers, uh, 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 and employers versus workers, and workers versus workers. A worker is enemy to the worker. You know, if you get fired, maybe I get a promotion. So this is the basically the Hobbesian war of all against all in the market. Uh, Hegel was talking about something uh, um, very similar to this. Right. So and the last facet of alienation is a bit more complicated. I'm going to talk about it in a second. But I want to stress, like alienation, this is early Marx, this is early young Marx trying to wrestle with the problem of capitalism. This appeals to a lot of students, especially first and second year students. They, they see this humane part of Marx. So actually, uh, uh, let me pause here and let me again uh, talk about, is there a possibility of overcoming alienation? And again, I, to I told you, I believe that capitalism, so sorry, communism for Marx, is a real historical phenomenon. It's not just a pie in the sky. So we should be able to point at present tendencies and say communism is going to be like that, but on a larger scale. So I want to say we have proofs of concept of communism, proofs of reality of communism. So again, feudalism is a direct coercion. Capitalism is coercion by the structural forces of the market. And communism is free rational cooperation for the sake of development and flourishing. Again, so people, each, uh, the, the free development of each is the condition for the free development of all, for Marx, very important. So we cooperate, we develop, and we flourish, therefore, together. Right? So let's take particular examples. Open source software, like Linux, for example, or uh, Wikipedia, Wikipedia articles. Um, Wikipedia articles, and, and think about alienation, right? Wikipedia articles, <laughs> people who write Wikipedia articles, they do this in their own spare time because they find it fulfilling. Nobody gets paid, right? So, and and the, the product, the Wikipedia article, is given as a free gift, if you want, to the rest of humanity. So presumably, there's no alienation from the product. You know, when the authors of Wikipedia are writing the articles, or, you know, when uh, um, software engineers, in their own spare time, because they want to develop their skills or because they want to contribute to humanity, right? Produce programs which they distribute for free, open source, right? Likewise, presumably people produce Wikipedia articles at their own pace, like not under sweatshop conditions. So there's also this uh, uh, um, lack of alienation from the process of labor. And especially this cooperate, you know, alienation of men from men. Under capitalism, again, it's like a, a, a worker tries to do as little work as possible and try to get as much for it as possible. The producer is trying to sell the shoddiest, the uh, 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 kind of least, um, <clears throat> a product of the least quality for the highest price, right? So this is co constant, comp everybody's an enemy under capitalism. But under this spherical communism in a vacuum, this thought experiment, this proof of concept, Wikipedia, no, again, I produce an article, I want everybody to see the article. In fact, I want everybody ideally to contribute to the article. Maybe they're going to find some uh, typos that I have made, or maybe they can increase uh, um, the value of the article by, you know, adding additional sources or reformulating my words, right? So it's a collaborative enterprise, it's standing on the shoulders of the giants. And I mean, obviously, uh, uh, um, the reason I talk about universities is that it, it's very clear. <laughs> so many members of the academia are sympathetic to Marx because I think that kind of this socialist communist, and again, I'm broadly speaking using socialism and communism as synonymous, uh, uh, socialist and communist ideas are, are to some extent are already implemented in the university. We're all approximately, there's approximate equality between professors, at least in most functional universities. It's approximate equality between teachers and students. Right? This is not a coercive uh, a process. And it, it's very clear to us 
Now, I am able to give this lecture because I've had wonderful teachers, and my relationship to them was free, rational, cooperative uh, uh, relation. And again, it's like, <laughs> ideally, you know, you could say, oh, this is all an ideological lie, and in fact, this course is vicious indoctrination. Who knows? It's a dangerous possibility, but it's a, it's a tragic possibility. I hope it's not true, but it's a possibility that this course is about indoctrination and you are forced to take this course and you are suffering as you are taking this course. But ideally, ideally, in my own head, I am trying to give the best lecture possible. It's in, imperfect, it's not perfect, right? But I'm trying to give the best lecture possible and because I'm in, I have intrinsic interest in philosophy. I am trying my best. And your presence, your cooperation, you listening to this lecture is a motivation for me to give a better lecture. If I was alone, if I was on my own, without students, this would not have been such a good lecture. And again, I, 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 uh, um, I talk about how um, I see my relationship to students less as teacher-student relationship and more as relationship between colleagues. Again, I learn from my students and my students learn from me. You know, students ask interesting questions, uh, uh, offer interesting counter-arguments. This is how we develop. They learn, you learn political philosophy from me, I learn political philosophy from you. And again, not to mention that there are so many books. I've had books I've read. I have, I've had teachers I've read. I mean, Karl Marx and uh, um, Aristotle and Plato were all in the same dialogue, it seems. Again, kind of, again, free development of each as a condition for the free development of all. And I suppose the free development of all as a condition for the free development of each, right? So university has this kind of quasi-socialist, uh, 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 um, system or element built into it. And you could say, well, uh, you know, the fact that you can make it work in some limited context doesn't mean that all society can be uh, create, cre you know, created, um, organized on the basis of free rational cooperation. And that's a complicated point. And you see, if we only talked about like works of art, let's say, you know, a society of painters where people only paint Maybe it's impossible because you gotta eat, you gotta have health care, <laughs> you gotta have uh, uh, you know shelter and clothing. So so maybe a society a society which is made only out of artists is impossible. But society which is organized like a university, you see, the beauty of the university system is that university produces knowledge, scientific, theoretical knowledge, but also practical knowledge, technology, kind of this uh, intrinsic connection. Again, talk about open source software, talk about Wikipedia, talk about universities. I mean, this is, this is a, this is a cop-out and a shortcut, but as a cop-out and a shortcut, think of robots. I mean, Marx doesn't know about robots, but he knows that the mechanical loom increases the productivity of workers' labor, let's say by 80 times. So if you have benefit of mechanization of production, you can work 80 times less and have as much stuff. And I mean, like imagine not working five days a week, but working one day a week. And the rest four days is just free. Right? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? Uh, uh, and again, so like robotization, technological progress, Marx doesn't talk about it explicitly, but it's implicit, it's implied in his, in his system. And kind of lastly, I wanna say, and of course people immediately begin to ask these questions. Well, uh, you know, if you're gonna give people free time, what are, they, what are they going to do with this free time? Are they going to be productive? Right? And this is why my last uh, example of the proof of concept, concept has to do with social welfare systems, social democratic systems. Now, these are, these are limited for all sorts of reasons. Uh, I suppose because, you know, Marx understands this. Globalization, we live in the, the capitalist system is a global system. And the prosperity of the countries, I mean, at the time of me recording this lecture, uh, uh, Luxembourg and Denmark are examples of countries with um, highly developed, you know, among the top exemplars of um, systems of um, social welfare, highest development. But uh, probably, so it's a, you know, it's a question for economists, but probably Luxembourg and Denmark cannot exist without the cheap labor and less than uh, perfect conditions for workers outside of Europe. You know, um, third world countries, we're talking about industrial China, we're talking about maybe the reserve army of the unemployed in Africa. Capitalism is a global system. Can Luxembourg and Denmark be prosperous without the cheap labor sourced from the outside, right? So, so what I'm saying is that Luxembourg and Denmark maybe are to some extent, who knows, maybe uh, 
let me give a broad range, 30 to 60% already in communism. It's a broad range. I'm, I mean, I'm not sure. It's a debatable question. You can, you can think about this on your own. But not 100%, because Luxembourg and Denmark do not exist in isolation. Not to mention that, again, this cheap labor that comes from the outside, Luxembourg and Denmark outsource their foreign policy. They exist behind the nuclear shield of the United States of America, which spends the nuclear, sorry, the military expenditure of the United States of America is equal to the rest of the, probably exceeds the rest of the world combined. You can look up the statistics. I'm sure they change from year to year, right? So <laughs> it, is, it is a limited proof of concept. It's not full-fledged communism, what I'm driving at. But still, when you talk about Luxembourg and Denmark, when we talk about social welfare, again, this idea for Marx a phrase that Marx did not invent, which he borrows from the French socialists, from each according to his ability to each according to his need. Let's not think about this in terms of utopia. Sometimes students see this phrase and they think, oh, this is some kind of you know, quasi-Christian paradise. No, 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 no. From each according to their ability to each according to their need. Let's make this concrete. Let's talk about specific needs. Needs such as healthcare, transportation, education, um, maybe food, shelter. Yes, and you, you can have municipal systems. I mean, Luxembourg, at the moment when this lecture is recorded, all public transportation in Luxembourg is free. All buses, uh, uh, trams, maybe even railways, right? So this is exactly what it means to each according to their need. You have a need in transportation, yeah? Let's arrange. I mean, it means sometimes students ask, oh, who's going to decide? Well, I'll tell you who's going to decide what is human need and what is not a human need. Again, we have this free rational discussion where people get together and they decide what is a need and what is a whim. And maybe it's impossible to say in, in advance. But again, as a, and so I don't want to jump to conclusions, right? So let's take Marx productively. Marx is not necessarily, you know, like Marx never claimed to be prophet from God. Marx, very importantly, does not say that, you know, he, he doesn't want to write cookbooks for the future, right? Or, you know, engage in predictions for the future. Who knows what communism is going to look like? Communism is going to be this, if it's going to arrive, because remember, I feel that the right reading of Marx is that communism is not necessarily inevitable. But if communism will arrive, then people will get together and they will decide collectively what communism will look like. But to some extent, we can see certain premonitions of communism in these examples. Okay, so we're trying to relate this abstract notion of alienation to <laughs> particular examples of social reality. And again, um, my strong assertion is that labor can be more or less alienated. And to the extent that labor can be more or less alienated, we, you could say that human beings in the 21st century find themselves to a lesser or to a greater extent already under communism. Probably nobody lives 100% under communism today, but we can, you know, we can see the premonitions. We can see the premonitions. Um, so let me let me go back. So again, so what would it mean to live in communism 100%? Is to get rid of alienation 100%? Maybe you know is is that possible? That's a separate question. But we can we can try. Again, uh, strong assumptions. You know this, which go back to ancient Greeks to Aristotle about this productive positive um, freedom. When we talk about John Stuart Mill, again this idea of higher, lower pleasures, right? and, and, and Marx actually has this interesting phrase. He says that under capitalism, human beings are mostly free. So again, talk, let's talk about higher and lower pleasures. Human beings are mostly free in their animal functions. This is lower pleasures. But in our properly human functions, what John Stuart Mill talk, calls higher pleasures, we are mostly unfree. It's like, again, in terms of, you know, what food to eat and what clothes to wear, <laughs> the, the, broadly speaking, animal functions. We're free. We're free to choose. But in terms of deployment of our creative capacity, it is the market that decides what we produce, how we produce. Again, you know, uh, I ask my students, why have they enrolled? I mean, I'm, I don't want to say that most of my students come from the bourgeoisie, but there's no way around this slightly unpalatable topic. If you have the spare time in the 21st century to engage in an education like this, to not study some kind of uh, vocational practical uh, subject, but to study this lofty detached subject like political philosophy, chances are you have the luxury of free time. And most people have the luxury of free time to study a subject like political philosophy. To some extent, they have to belong to the bourgeoisie. right? But the question is, if you, if you listen to this, having been enrolled in a particular program, who has chosen 
your specialization. Again, I teach mostly first and second year students, and for the vast majority of my, and this may be uh, not necessarily true across the board, but for the vast majority of my students, the choice is made to them, by, for, just, the choice is not made by them, the choice is made for them by the market, the coercive laws of competition in the market. Tell to their parents that if you want to protect your capital, if you want to protect your investments, let's say your children need to go and get an, let's say, economic education. And this is, this is the, the choice that the market makes for you. Again, in our human functions, it is the market that decides uh, for us. And so many students tell me that they are in love with philosophy or maybe with fundamental physics and they want to be, you know, uh, uh, you know pursue, you know, think about the Large Hadron Collider and the STEM model of particle physics, but the market tells them they're going to be an investment banker. It's not their choice, right? And talk about the, the alienation even that the bourgeoisie suffers. So anyway, so alienation from product, so people feel alienated from product, the, the, the product of their labor does not fulfill them, from the process, they don't work uh, um, in their own, at their own pace, uh, they do not feel uh, connected, related to other people in the, in the process of their work. And again, the strong assumption behind Marx is, philosophy that we have seen in so many other philosophers is that for human beings to be properly happy and properly human, we have to work together. The free development of each as a condition for the free development of all. Again, individuality is important for Marx, but individuality is a product of a well-ordered community. You cannot be a proper, well-rounded individual if you live in the capitalist war of all against all. And this is what this last phrase, which is a complicated phrase, the German phrase is Gattungswesen, which is translated by this uh, uh, English word, species being, it's a very difficult word. But basically what it means is that to be human is to be social. Man is by nature, a, human beings are by nature political. That there's a, an inalienable social element in, in, in humanity. Again, we talked about this when we discussed Hegel last time, that human thought is based on human language, and language is social, and society is historical. So that's why our thought, the, our deepest self-identification is linguistic, and therefore social, therefore historical. Right? So, uh, uh, again, not to mention that I could give you a million examples, but any kind of meaningful <laughs> creative job requires cooperation. Again, it's like a, 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 <laughs> the, the, maybe the most instinctual kind of human life is possible in isolation, although probably children would just die if they're not properly raised by parents. But anything, even hunting and gathering, requires people to learn the skill of hunting and gathering from other human beings. Again, go back to uh, 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 Jean-Jacques Rousseau, perfectibility. Human beings are underdetermined by instincts. We need society to fill in the blanks, right? And, and Marx insists that, again, I mentioned this already, but it's an important phrase, that in, in communism there's not going to be a difference between altruism and egoism. Because at the end of the day, I want to be a fulfilled free individual. But in order for me to have a meaningful life, I have to engage in creative labor. Marx thinks that if you Together with Mill, Marx thinks that if you really have uh, spare time on your hands, your life will be bleak and meaningless unless you produce something creatively, you do something useful with your time. Be a musician or an artist or a poet or an engineer, do something with your life. Right? And as human beings become happy by developing their creative potential, they're also uh, advancing and developing society. Right? And this is, this is the ultimate point. This is maybe the, uh, uh, the upshot, right? So under feudalism, we have forced division of labor. We have this uh, uh, technology of production inherited from our forefathers, which doesn't change. And we have this domination of men from men, men by men. Under capitalism, we produce, again, this performance principle, efficiency for the sake of efficiency, profit for profit's sake, which doesn't care about individual humanity or human development. But Communism is the promise of the voluntary division of labor. Marx says that freedom begins, the, the realm of freedom begins on the other side of the realm of necessity. Human beings getting together and rationally deciding how they're going to satisfy their needs and beyond the satisfaction of their needs, this unchaining of the creative potential of human individuality. Right? And Marx, very interestingly, says <laughs> the reduction of the length of the working day is its basic prerequisite. So again, like if you're ever you know, uh, stuck thinking about you know, Soviet China or Soviet Russia, think about this. Marx says 
Communism is the reduction of the length of the working day. <laughs> or let's say the basic prerequisite of communism, the most important prerequisite of communism, is the reduction of the length of the working day. And you know, not two days off a week, but maybe three or four days off a week. What would that society look like? Right? And in this sense, Marx says that overcoming alienation, achieving this freedom, is going to be the end of human prehistory. So I think that if Marx saw our situation today, maybe he would say that there are some isolated pockets of communism, but by and large, we are still living in human prehistory. Humanity is not in control of its fate. Human history, the history of free rational decision-making, free, you know, the history of human freedom is going to begin on the other side of capitalism. And I could give so many examples, but sort of, again, the idea of the social contract is, you know, we have a wish list of things I want to achieve. You have a wish list of things you want to achieve. Let's get together and decide what we want to achieve. Let me give you some suggestions, right? So it's like uh, uh, preparing for the next pandemic or uh, uh, fighting against climate change or let's say pr protecting the earth against meteor strikes. Um, right? Are these high on the wish list? <laughs> Probably yes, right? So it's like Stephen Hawking, late Stephen Hawking, spoke about the uh, uh, threat of the meteor impact as the highest underrated, underappreciated threat to human species. And the question is, do we as humanity spend enough resources trying to protect ourselves from that? We have the technological capacity, but are we spending this capacity? I mean, I, I could talk about universal health care, you know, but, you know, the, the coronavirus pandemic has shown <laughs> that the, the globalized world, we're in this together. There's a reason, and again, Marx has this cosmopolitan outlook, that there's a reason why you know, workers in Britain should care about the welfare of workers in China or in India or in Africa. We're in this together, right? Again, there's a kind of uh, um, deep commonality between what Marx is talking about and what Mill is talking about. The free development of each as the condition for the free development of all, all over the globe, all over the earth, right? But what I'm driving at is that the reason we are not prepared for the next pandemic. We were not prepared for this pandemic and not really very well prepared for the next pandemic. The reason why we, we do not do a very good job of fighting climate change, even though the technology is very s certainly there. The, the, the reason why we do not prepare, we're not very well prepared, uh, you know, against meteor strikes, and I could continue this topic list, is because, by and large, we are ruled by the coercive laws of competition in the market. It is not, it is not us, humanity, who collectively decides that, you know, we don't care about the future of our children, let the meteor destroy the earth. No, 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 no. It is the market that decides that it's less efficient, it doesn't, it's not conducive to the profits in the next couple of months to fight against these things. And kind of, if you agree with this analysis, at least to some extent, then Marx has something to offer. 